It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Monster Monday presented by DraftKings. New week means new winners. By the way, I'm so fired up for today's guest, my buddy Sage Rosenfels. I got to ask him, I think 12 years in the NFL as a quarterback. Maybe I'm shorting him one. Maybe I'm giving him one he shouldn't have. I don't know. I know this much. He got drafted 20 years ago this month because we were rookies together on the Washington football team back in 2001. Where does the time go? Sage played for about a million teams, including Kyle Shanahan. So I wanted to pick his brain a little bit on Kyle Shanahan's system and who he thinks Kyle might be targeting at number three. First, though, you need to know how you can be part of the show. You can be the winner if you spread the word via social media, at Ross Tucker NFL, at Ross Tucker Pod. I'm not sure there's an easier contest. I love sending you guys autographed press passes or football cards or pictures or whatever. Sponsor confirmation email winner. Take advantage of any of the glorious sponsors like Keeps. If you're trying to keep your hair like I am or any of the ones we talk about, ExpressVPN, they're all on the sponsors page at RossTucker.com. But also, you get a chance to go ahead and get a great deal, but also get your question asked and answered on the show and maybe win a little something, something. Then the YouTube shout out, YouTube.com slash RossTucker NFL. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. All right, so I, I guess we should start with that, Sage. How many years did you play? Well, I like to say 12, but legitimately, it was 11. It was 11 uh, accrued seasons, I think is the phrase they use. But my 12th year, I got a half a million dollar signing bonus and didn't make the team. And as you know, Ross, as we were rookies together, and I think it was 209 was the rookie salary. So when someone gives you a half a million dollars, you do the off-season work, you do the training cam work, and you get cut, to me, that counts. So I always say 12 years, but in actuality, it's only 11. So wait a minute. What what team was that when? That was the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, Christian Ponder was in his second year. Uh, I had signed back there, and, and uh, they kept three young quarterbacks. Joe Webb, uh, who, you know, I don't know if he's still in the NFL, but, you know, long time sort of special teamer, great athlete. But he was like the super sort of, physically gifted uh, quarterback from UAB and uh, I can't remember who else they kept, but I, I didn't make the team that year, uh, 2012. Uh, they ended up making the playoffs and Ponder was hurt and Joe Webb had to start that playoff game against the Packers and it was pretty ugly. So, uh, you know, that's the way it goes, but yeah, I'm pretty, pretty proud of my 11 slash 12 seasons and obviously started off with you in Washington uh, for, for the listeners out there, uh, Ross Tucker in my family was known as Uncle Ross because I had a small child at the time, my son Peyton, who is now a freshman in college <laughs> out at Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles. He's 19, almost 20 years old. Uh, and, and Ross was sort of like the uncle. He'd come sort of hang out with us a little bit, meet us at the playground outside the apartment complex. And, and uh, you know, he and I were two guys probably – uh, probably just a little different than everybody else. You know, I'm not trying to say we're smarter, uh, but we were different. We liked conversations about all sorts of things. We weren't just sort of football only. We could talk about a lot of things. I, if I wouldn't have got a scholarship to Iowa State, there was thoughts about maybe going to an Ivy League school. Uh, so yeah, so I, for whatever reason, Ross and I sort of hit it off right away. Two rookies trying to make the make, trying to make the NFL. Marty Schottenheimer. You know, Brian Schottenheimer, my quarterback's coach, he was 26 years old. Jeff George uh, was our starting quarterback for a couple of games. And Ross, now you could talk, we could talk about that for, for days. Uh, but yeah, you and I go back a long ways. 20 years ago, uh, probably 20 years ago in, in the month of May is when we met. I'm sure we, after the draft, more than you know, a week or two, we, we flew out there for like a rookie mini camp or something like that. And, and you were, uh, you know, trying to make the, trying to make the team. And you did at, you played right guard, you played right tackle, and then all of a sudden there's a preseason game, I think it was the second one, where you were playing left tackle with a broken thumb, and you told me on my seven-step drops to not get any depth, and looking back on the film, 
I distinctly remember getting about five yards deep on a seven step drop because Ross was going to run him around the outside and he wasn't going to get, he was going to get it to 10 or 11 yards. And so, yeah, we go back a long ways. You protected me many a times and I'm very thankful for it. Dude, that is awesome. Uh, I mean, I, I told you 20 minutes, honestly, I just, you talking right there, it could be an hour, 20 minutes. No, no question about it. I do have to ask this. Was that how your career ended getting cut by Minnesota? Was that it? Was that the last year? Yeah, that was the end of it. You know, it's pretty interesting how my career went. You know, I played a ton. I played some in 2006. You know, Kyle Shanahan was just our receivers coach and Gary Kubiak in, in, uh, in Houston. 2007, Kyle was my quarterback's coach. And you could tell, like, sort of having a lot of influence with Kubiak and what we were doing. And then full on 2008, he was the OC. Uh, and I think for the most part, calling the plays, especially that second half of that year. And I started 10 games uh, in 2007, 2008. So I was starting to play a lot, you know, years seven, eight, nine in the NFL. And then, you know, I went up to Minnesota, uh, backed up Brett. Well, I was hoping to start. Brett Favre showed up. Well, that ended. Uh, I got to have that amazing 2009 season with him and in, in, in the NFC Championship game and, and the New Orleans Saints and and the Bounty Gate game, we got to be a part of that. Um, and then the next year, when Favre came back a second time, traded traded to the New York Giants, backed up Eli. Um, and then I went on IR the following year and sort of ended up in Minnesota and got cut. And that was the end of it. And, and what's amazing was I, in those that 2007-8 uh, seasons, I started 10 games and never, I never threw an NFL pass after that in a regular season game. You know, a lot of preseason games, but never actually threw an NFL pass in a regular season that's what happens when you back up Favre and Eli. Those guys never get hurt. Their backups never play, and they just sort of go away, and that's what happened to me. Well, listen, I don't want to belabor the point, uh, but getting $500,000 to end your career is not a, bad, not a bad way to go out. That is amazing. So I'm glad you brought up Kyle Shanahan because I know you played in a lot of systems. I don't even know. You could probably tell me how many, but I know multiple times you have told me that that Kyle Shanahan, Kubiak, Mike Shanahan system was by far the best one you ever played in. Why? Like, what what makes it so good? Well, let's not forget by Matt Lafleur was quality control on that staff. All right, Robert Sala was quality control on that staff. I mean, it's pretty amazing going back to you know that two thousand six, seven, eight year in Houston. Uh, those years and the, the the coaches that end up in where, wherever they went after that is pretty pretty wild. But Kyle's system and Kubiak's system really allowed me to sort of just do my job as a quarterback. You know, and, and you played with, with Tom Brady in New England. A lot of audibles, a lot of checks, a lot of things that Tom could do. He sort of had the whole full menu uh, at his fingertips. That's a lot for for a quarterback. That's a lot for an offensive lineman to have a a, a coordinator or a quarterback constantly audibly and changing things up and changing protections, right? A lot of thinking going on. And that system, not that it doesn't force a quarterback to think, but it doesn't force a quarterback to have to sort of um, manage every aspect of the offense. You are a part of the offense. You are not the offense. And so you can go out there and just sort of execute and function um, and do what you're sort of taught in practice. Your feet sort of tell you where to go with the football. All of your reads you know, are sort of pre-designed, and, and you talk about in meetings, hey, when we get this coverage, we're going to go here. When we get this coverage, we're going to go here. Uh, you know, on this play, we're going to go one, two, three, four versus all coverages. And it's just very uh, precise that way from a sort of a quarterback responsibility standpoint. There's not a lot of gray area. And I think people don't realize gray area for a quarterback um, is can create, uh, 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 you know, just not that you're second guessing yourself, but you have hesitation. To, hesitation. That's that's probably the right word, right? Hesitation. When you know it, when the ball hits your hand, black and you know, Kyle told me this, black and white. This is what my read is, and you've done it so many times. You can then just go out there and play, and there is no hesitation. There isn't like, well, versus this coverage, maybe we're supposed to go, but we could go back here. You know exactly where you're supposed to sort of go with the football, at least start your, your reads and your progressions. They also, of course, do a great job of getting guys open. You know, they could, Andre Johnson was probably the top receiver or one of the top receivers in the game during that era. 
Yeah, he's still catching 120 balls a year, 115 balls a year, 110 balls a year. How do they do that? They, they, the way they designed plays, they would get guys open, right? I always say the 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 OC, the, the quarterbacks that are great throwing to their first read have coordinators that are really good at getting that first read open, some one way or another, through a formation, through a play action, through a bootleg, whatever it might be, they can get that first guy open. On top of it, by the way, the play action and bootleg game for a quarterback is it's a quarterback's best friend. You know, of course, to have the running game, we all know it helps out a quarterback, but then to have something off of that running game that looks like the run, but then allows a quarterback to actually have time. Ross, if I asked you when you're a, an offensive lineman, if you could run the ball, throw screens, three-step drop, uh, play action, bootleg, or seven-step drop back up uh, out of the shotgun, which is the worst? Seven-step drop out of the shotgun. Exactly, right. Well, you watch a lot of football teams. You watch, you know, shoot, you watch the uh, uh, the Houston Texans over the last few years. Deshaun Watson, shotgun on first down. It's not easy to live that way. Now, he had all that ability to run around and, and do all these things, but you know, for most guys, that's a hard place to be. For the left tackle, that's a hard life to live when your coordinator is calling shotgun seven-step drop on first down. They didn't do that. So when you fake that run, whether it's a boot or a play action, the defense has to play run for a good second or two before then they rush the passer. Well, then that, And also it sucks up the linebackers. It sucks up safeties. It gets guys out of their sort of drop back passing lanes. When I would just drop back, linebackers and safeties drop back to in the spots where they're trying to keep the ball in front of them. But all, but the, but the running game and the play action bootleg stuff really sort of throws them out of their, uh, their, their drop back lanes and allows guys to become sort of wide open and allows the quarterback to have more time, allows you to, to fake a run and really actually take a shot down the field. If you catch a ball on shotgun and try to throw a post route, you might be having to shuffle around the pocket a lot to buy some time so your receiver can get 50 yards downfield. The play action bootleg game allows you time to do that. You know, I know from having talked to Kyle Shanahan a couple of times, one time in particular, he made it clear how much he loved Matt Schaub. This might have been his first year in Washington, and he really thought Matt Schaub was a really good player. It's been well documented how he feels about Kirk Cousins. What is it about Schaub and Cousins do you think that Shanahan likes so much? So this is going to lead us into Matt Jones, right? I know, I know where you're going with this. Um, I think he loves one accuracy. Accurate quarterbacks, right? You know, uh, uh, Steve Kerr can design whatever play he wants, but if he doesn't have Steph Curry out there to shoot the ball, it doesn't really matter. You need to, you need to have a guy who's an accurate passer. Uh, Kyle is probably feels he's good enough to design plays to get guys open enough. He just needs an executor back there. He needs somebody that can really execute what his plan is, and uh, you know, and and, and he doesn't. Um, he wants a guy he can depend on day in and day out, knows the offense inside and out, and is just going to be consistent all the time. Matt Schaub is a very consistent passer, right? He didn't miss guys that, that were wide open, uh, you know, very often. And I think that's what Kyle's really looking for. He also, and as we, as we talk about the draft here a little bit, when I watch Mac Jones, what excites me about him and those qualities that, that everyone's sort of comparing to a Kirk Cousins or comparing to a Matt Schaub or maybe a Matt Ryan uh, is that Mac has great rhythm in his feet. Uh, and that's hard to like describe over a podcast or a, or a TV show unless you're actually watching film. But the ability to sort of go back, looking to your right, and as, you, as you're going back, not liking what you see, like the, the, the past pattern that the coach has called is not going to be open, and then in nice rhythm, working your way backside to like an in-cut coming backside. This is a drill I do with my quarterback collective uh, quarterbacks all the time because it teaches you to sort of move on with progressions while keeping your feet in a nice rhythm. And rhythm creates accuracy, right? It really does. And uh, Matt Jones does that. Kirk Cousins does that very well. Matt Schaub did that extremely well of having this sort of nice rhythm uh, in the pocket to sort of move on with your progressions. A lot of quarterbacks don't do that very well, in particular in college. They, they sincerely don't teach that in college football. They don't teach any sort of rhythm passing to sort of progress through your reads uh, in that way. I, 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 I watch enough film 
that I don't see that very often. And I, you know, Kirk Cousins and Matt Schaub do it. So they're accurate and they have nice rhythm to, to, to sort of progress through uh, the reads to, you know, end up finding somebody uh, with this, you know, beautifully designed play that Kyle Shanahan or Matt LaFleur or Sean McVay has, has designed. Okay. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, Sage, but it sounds like you think that's who the Niners are going to draft at three, or do you think it could be Justin Fields or Trey Lance? Well, you know, about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks, eh, it might have been like two weeks ago, I I hadn't really watched Mac Jones, to be honest with you. I'm not one of these big draft gurus. Maybe I should get into that business more often. I know people just love the draft, and they love the quarterbacks in the draft. And and I'd watched a little bit of Mac Jones tape, and I just was like, mm, I'm just not impressed. You know, this guy – to, to really trade two to three first round draft picks. I'm thinking you're going up for somebody special, like who has special, who has a very high ceiling, who has really special talents. And, you know, go online and look up a picture of Mac, Mac Jones with his, with his t-shirt off. You don't see special. You see a Ross Tucker is what you see. You know, it's, he's not like he's a, he's a physical specimen. He's not a runner. He's not fast. He doesn't have a big arm, right? Um, he moves around pretty good, but he, he's not a, a great athlete. And so I thought to my, and I, and I tweeted like, Mac Jones is not going number three. I just, I did, I didn't see that. I didn't see the top end window for Kyle or any offensive coordinator to, to sort of sell out for the next couple of years for this guy, for this guy who's sort of a, um, to me, didn't ha doesn't have a high, high ceiling. Uh, but when I went and watched the SEC championship the other day, about four or five days ago, I sat there and I was, I was really sort of blown away by, again, like what, what, what I was talking about with, with, with Matt Schaub and, and Kirk Cousins. His accuracy obviously is very, very good. But is his ability to sort of progress through the play with his feet and stay in rhythm and move around just a little bit, just enough to help out his offensive lineman for a college player I was really impressed. And I, and a lot of times I, I, not that I look down on a little bit, but you know, the guys that play at Clemson, the guy that plays at, at Alabama, the guy that plays at Ohio state, they're, they're dealing with the best players in the, in college football against inferior opponents every single week. I mean, they, they do, you know, they, they, they unless it's a the championship game or a, a BCS game or something. So I always sort of go, you know, did they make their team better? Like did Alabama, win because of Mac Jones, Alabama win because they probably have some of the best talent in college football, right? And so I always like the guys, like a Drew Brees who goes to Purdue, who raises the level of everybody else. If you took Drew Brees off of Purdue, maybe they win three games in, in 2000. They, don't, they definitely don't win the Rose Bowl, right? So Drew made them better, brought them to a whole nother level. And I just didn't sort of see that with Mac Jones. When I watched that SEC championship game, I was like, wow, this kid is – He's like NFL ready. He has that ability to sort of step in. I can see him running Kyle's offense. I can see him run a, a you know, a Sean McVay, Matt LaFleur offense extremely well. Um, his accuracy, his decision-making, that rhythm I was talking about, um, you could see that. And again, you don't see that in college football very often, so that's that far along. It's almost like he's three or four years along from a sort of a footwork standpoint into the NFL as a you know to be rookie right now so that that sort of changed my opinion of like well maybe mac jones could be that guy I, I don't know i do know this um i had a conversation with somebody uh related i would say related to the san francisco organization uh within the last year um and they definitely said that kyle was really wanting to have a more athletic quarterback than jimmy garoppolo um you know he's he's probably watching Russell Wilson run around and make things happen. He's watching obviously Pat Mahomes run around and make things happen. Great passers, but also guys that can do more. And it's just really hard unless you sort of have Tom Brady, um, maybe a couple other guys to get really far in this league with sort of a statuesque quarterback. And, you know, Tom wins with, with his, I want his accuracy is off the charts, but obviously with his mind, he has seen every single look a thousand times. Well, you're not going to get that with any rookie. That's going to take a you know a decade or two to build up. So um, I just was sort of like, is I, I, that Justin Fields made sense to me? You know, when everyone's talking about this, Mac Jones and Chris Sims came out and think Mac Jones is going to be the guy. And I'm like, you know, I know Chris and Kyle are friends. I'm not sure that's a smokescreen there. 
But that didn't make a lot of sense to me because I'm thinking Justin Fields has the top end talent. I've seen, I, I worked with Justin Fields at the camp. I watched him throw when he was 17, 18 years old. Now I was just blown away. Like this kid is going to be an awesome college and maybe pro football player. And physically, he has like sort of the body of a running back. He ran a 4-4-4 or 4 4 3 or something. His his numbers are astronomical in college ball. And they're not throwing wide receiver screens over there at Ohio State. They are pushing the ball down the field regularly. You know, he has that sort of Russell Wilson accuracy of, of down the field, which you don't see, you know, a lot, especially amongst a, a really athletic quarterback. So I when that happened, that trade happened, to me, it felt like Justin Fields was going to be that guy because of these sort of the, the high, high ceiling. Like you could get a transcendent football player. I didn't see Mac Jones as a transcendent football player because of just sort of the physical limitations. But then again, as I said, I watched that SEC game against Florida and I recommend you go back. I mean, it was like it was like it was like 56 to 48 or 60 to 52 or something crazy high scoring game. And he was just on fire uh, in that game. Now he was going against. Um, you know, pretty good team at uh, University of Florida. But that sort of changed my mind. Like, maybe it's not Justin Fields. I can see Kyle watching that game, you know, the, you know late, in the, uh, late in the NFL season, on, as we know, on a Saturday night, uh, as you have a game on Sunday and watching the SEC Championship game and being like, I need, this is the kid I want. I, I can see that. I can see Kyle going, this is the type of guy I'm looking for. Accurate, smart. Uh, great rhythm in, in his throwing motion, natural thrower. That's a big thing they talk about, being a natural thrower. In a weird way, Justin Fields isn't a natural thrower. I don't feel like his motion's a little a little bit interesting to me. He throws a great ball, but doesn't feel totally natural and definitely doesn't have great rhythm in his feet. Um, but maybe he, has, well, he wasn't taught that. You, know, you never know what these guys are being taught in college either. So honestly, that, that again, that, that sort of changed my opinion of, Maybe it's not Justin Fields. Maybe it is Mac Jones. I really don't know. It's the great mystery of the 2021 draft, isn't it? And you know, it's like no one even talks about the Zach Wilson thing to the Jets. We just sort of figure that's going to happen. But shoot, maybe they take Justin Fields. We have no idea, right? So, But it does seem like that third pick and then also maybe the fourth pick uh, from that is, are the great mysteries of this draft. It's been, it, it's, it's been an odd, odd uh, uh, offseason, draft offseason. Uh, in the NFL this year, in particular amongst quarterbacks, because there's a whole bunch of really good. We haven't even talked about Trey Lance, which I've only watched a little bit of film on him, but he's a really talented kid as well. He has that sort of big upside too that I can see a, a young coach, you know, really, really liking. So, Sage, uh, last thing I want to ask you is about you. How many times were you traded? Three. Is that a record? I, you know, it might be. I don't. I think. Ray, well, Randy Moss has traded three times. So me and Randy, we have a lot of similarities. We have a lot in common, including three trades. But yeah, you know, Washington, as you know, uh, with you with Marty Schottenheimer's rookie, Steve Spurrier comes in that second year. I don't know if you were starting, but you and I played in a preseason game in Osaka, Japan, right? Uh, not, not many people can say that. I started that game against the 49ers, and then at the end of that preseason, traded first trade to the Miami Dolphins. Um, four years later, I'm a free agent after playing for Nick Saban, free agent, go to the Houston Texans. And after three years there, I sort of forced a trade because Schaub was the starter to the Minnesota Vikings. And then again, when Favre came back that second time, Jim Sorge got hurt in New York backing up Eli. And I again got traded for a third time, uh, to, to the New York Giants. You got three trades in that career. That is, I mean, that is unusual, man. Real. I, I got traded once. And I was so happy because I'd already been cut three times or maybe twice. Two or three, I was like, traded? What they what they trade for me? <laughs> yeah, but the trade trades the trade's the best way to go for a couple of reasons. One, if they cut you and you have to go to a new team, you have to pay for all of your move. That's right. One, you, know, you get traded, they pay for everything. Yeah. Two, it means somebody really wants you. Like, is he willing to give up something for you? Right. It's always nice to be wanted. When you're cut, it's like, no, you know, it's like it's like you can't get into the prom. Like nobody wants me. When you get traded, it's like, oh, it's got a different girlfriend now. That's not a bad deal. And they'll pay for my move. But yeah, being traded is much better than being cut. Check him out on Twitter at Sage Rosenfels18. As you can tell, he is the man. Goat of the preseason. I never saw that before <laughs> on your bio. You gotta check out all the things he's got going on. As you can tell absolutely awesome guy sage thank you so much for coming on the show all right ross thanks for having me on man that was honestly i gotta get him back again 
soon. Really soon. That was awesome. Speaking of soon, UFC 261 is this weekend. And they've got 26 to 1 odds on either title contender to reign victorious. Masvidal, Usman, how about that? Just use code Ross to turn your $5 into $130 if the fighter of your choosing takes home the crown. Always DraftKings Sportsbook. Always code Ross. Tuck Stakes. Hey, Ross, well, let's start with uh, a story we, we talked about last Friday. Uh, Rams, Aaron Donald. Um, his accuser apologized after the video shows Donald was actually a peacekeeper. You know, and what I don't like, Bri, is always, 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 the initial report gets a lot more attention than the apology or the cover-up or whatever, right? Whatever you want to call it. But certainly, you watch the video, Aaron Donald was actually trying to get guys to stop hitting this guy who was down on the ground. And then somebody pulled Aaron Donald out of there being like, hey, you can't be um, you can't be associated with this in any capacity. So the guy apologized, thankfully. It's a good lesson. Uh, it really is. And why we should always take a little bit of time, take a deep breath, and allow things to play out a little bit. And I guess it's a good thing that they've got cameras a lot of places now, too. Tux Takes. On the transaction front, the Cleveland Browns released D-tackle Sheldon Richardson. That saves him $11 million on the cap. And cornerback J.C. Jackson signs his tender with the Patriots. Sheldon Richardson's a good player. Uh, you know, it wouldn't shock me if he signed back in Cleveland, probably not. Usually doesn't happen, but it does happen sometimes. Vince Williams was one. Carlos Dunlap was another. But this saves them a lot of money on the cap. My guess is the Browns will see how the draft goes. And depending on how the draft falls, probably take a D-tackle. If it doesn't go real well, then the Browns could circle back to Sheldon Richardson. But after they paid clowning what they paid them, Obviously, the Browns had a lot of uh, a, a lot of money they were giving to Clowney, and they needed to free up some cap space. J.C. Jackson's interesting. He was a restricted free agent. There aren't many of them these days, but he was a restricted free agent. And I, I saw a report out there that he really tried to get an offer sheet from someone. Any, mo any more money than he was getting to England. Any more money than the tender. Wasn't able to do it. Tuck Stakes. And lastly, presumptive number one pick Trevor Lawrence tweeted out comments he recently made to Sports Illustrated regarding not having a chip on his shoulder. Right. I thought that was interesting. Um, first of all, he talked about the fact he was in, interviewed by Sports Illustrated. I didn't read the whole thing yet, but I saw the quotes where he said, like, I, I'm not that guy that has a huge chip on my shoulder and I'm not going to pretend like I am or manufacture. I just can't do that. I can't make it seem like I've got this big chip on my shoulder. Well, of course, Trevor Lawrence, I'm going to pick. People made a big deal out of that. People made it sound like he doesn't love football that much. We even had a conversation uh, with the patrons, patreon.com slash RT Media. By the way, shout out to Matthew Silcox. He's the latest patron. We love it. Patreon.com slash RT Media. Thank you, Matthew. Welcome aboard. But I know on uh, our private Slack channel for Tuckheads, they were even saying, I don't think he'll have a long career. Doesn't seem he's that committed to it. So he wanted to tweet to make sure people realized that he loves football very internally motivated to have a great career. He just doesn't have like this big chip. on. He just wouldn't define it as a chip on his shoulder. And honestly, why would he? I mean, number one high school player in the country since he was in ninth grade, number one prospect, number one at Clemson, wins national championship, all that stuff, going to be the number one pick. I mean, what? where's the chip? You know, what What? What chip is on his shoulder? Is he, what, what slight is he looking to come back from? 
But that doesn't mean he can't be like Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck, or these other guys that didn't necessarily have a chip on their shoulder. Also, Bri, the Bengals got new uniforms. I I like uh, – would it be monotone? Not monotone. What's it? Monochromatic? I, I like – the all black and the all white. What is that, Bri? Yeah, where the pants are the same color as the shirts. Yeah, mono what? What's it called? We'll just go with mono. I think it's monochromatic, I want to say. Interesting, because you think it should be monotone, but monotone is like monotone, talking in a monotone voice. I believe it's one color is monochromatic. I'm not sure. So instead, I'll just give – I'll say, number one, Emery's Elite on today's college draft podcast was amazing. The 12 guys, more than any other, Emery wants on his team coming out of this draft, no matter where they get drafted. Check it out on today's college draft podcast. And then the shout-outs, Pizza Boy Brewing, Sportaculture, Vision Comics with an X, HumanHeadNYC.com. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mention DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, one 800 with it. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, doesn't always, sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit.